Welcome again. In this session, we're going to be reading Luke chapter 21, verses 5, all the way through to verse 38. Now, this is Luke's account of the signs of the end times. Now, this is not going to be an extensive or an exhaustive study. We're looking at just particularly what Luke is saying here. Now, I'm going to be doing other videos and other teachings on the whole subject and basically getting into much more detail than what I'm getting here, getting into here on this video. But let's get into this. And I'm, I guarantee you, I'm going to be getting into things, even though I'm not going to get into too much, I'm going to be saying things that you've never heard before. Things that I, you know, I've learned throughout the years and, you know, quite, uh, quite honestly, it took me a long time to learn. So fasten your seatbelts and let's get into it. Verse 5. As some were talking about the temple and how it was decorated with beautiful stones and gifts, he said, that's Jesus, As for these things which you see, the days will come in which there will not be left here one stone on another that will not be thrown down. Now, is he talking in a literal sense? Does he literally mean that there will not be one stone left upon another. I mean, there are a lot of people today, they would say, Jesus said that there will not be left one stone upon another. He means that there will not be one stone left upon another. It's going to be leveled, completely leveled. In that case, if, if that's the case, this has not yet been fulfilled. And I know there are some people, they're called preterists, and these people believe that all, you know, all Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled. And so, if you go to Jerusalem today, you will see the remains of the temple. And I'm telling you, there is a lot more than just one stone left upon another. There, <laughs> there are remains of the temple. So, literally, this has not been fulfilled. You got to look at it from the other, you know, you got to look at it from all points of view. If Jesus is just talking in a figurative sense, then you might say this could have been fulfilled in 70 AD. How, however, you know, to say that not one stone was, you know, will be left upon another is still pretty is stretching it. So, you know, really, um, it does not appear that this scripture has been fulfilled in its entirety as of yet, okay? Because we have a lot more than one stone that is upon another uh, as it stands today. Verse 7, they asked him, teacher, so when will these things be? Great question, right? What is the sign that these things are about to happen? Verse 8, he said, watch out that you don't get led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, or simply, I am. In other words, I am a God. And the time is at hand. Therefore, don't follow them. I'm going to stop here again. Notice that the first thing Jesus said, first and foremost, he said, do not be deceived. Do not let anyone lead you astray. That is so vital. That is so vital in this whole story of the end times because, you know, the scripture says in the end times, the church, so to speak, will, will fall from the faith. You know, that there will be a great falling away. There will be many people who uh, are many churches that have begun good, but they end not so good. The end dead or the end deceived. It's very, very important for every one of you within the sound of my voice to really study for yourself. Really get into this for yourself. Really, really do your research, okay? Don't, you know, depend on, you know, any any just Joe Blow or willy-nilly just to tell you what the scriptures say. You need to get into this for yourself. You need to really do your research. Read and pray that you understand what you read. And some, I'm telling you, there are a lot of you who are listening to me. What the, you will, <laughs> if you really read this honestly, you will have to admit that 
a lot of things that you have heard in the past about the end times is not really what the Bible says, okay? There are a lot of theories, there are a lot of teachings out there, even within the Christian world, even with the, you know, in the evangelical Christian world that are not true with the scripture. And I know there are a lot of people, a lot of Christians that are so easily led astray because they think of, you know, so-and-so, he's got a big ministry. He's a famous preacher. He's a famous evangelist. You know, he's a famous, he's a well-trusted, you know, name in Christian, in Christianity. And so they believe these doctrines or teachings just because their favorite celebrity preacher teaches it. I want to challenge you to be like the men of Berea in Acts chapter 17. Don't believe anything, even if the apostle Paul himself comes to you, as they didn't, you know, as he did in Acts chapter 17 to the men of Berea. The apostle Paul himself, the, I mean, this is the author of two thirds of the so-called New Testament. The author himself comes to deliver the message to preach. And most Christians today, by far most Christians today, it's like everything that Paul said, all the doctrine of Paul is the word of God. Well, back then the men of Berea said, we're not going to believe Paul unless we search the scriptures ourselves to, to see whether or not what Paul said is true. Let me just put a little bug in your ear too. The, The scriptures they had wasn't New Testament scriptures. Okay. Consider that. The scriptures they had back then was the Tanakh, okay, which included, and the Septuagint, which included a lot of books that you will not find in today's Protestant Bibles. I know I said a mouthful there in the fa- in the past several sentences, but hey, he who has an ear, let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says. Don't be so proud to think that everything that you've ever believed in the past is true because, you know, just, there are a lot of Christians today, they just, they're so proud. They're like, why? Well, they don't say it, but they act like this. They act like, I'm so, you know, I'm so good. I, I will never believe a lie. I will never believe something that's false because I follow the teaching of so-and-so or this and that. And uh, I'm in within this circle. I'm in with, you know, with these prophecy guys with these Bible prophecy guys, or with this famous evangelist, or with this famous Christian celebrity that we see on TV all the time. Listen, my friend, you need to get out of the mindset of trusting somebody else, and you better get in the mindset of getting your your face, <laughs> getting your head buried, you know, buried into the scriptures. Jesus warned people, he rebuked people over and over again. Have you not read? You know, have you not read? You know, he said it over and over again. He rebuked people for not knowing the scriptures. You need to know the scriptures. Much more important than knowing any Christian celebrity, preacher celebrity, you know, on TV today or on the radio or, you know, you need to get into the scriptures yourself. Get your head buried into the scriptures. Read it, study it, pursue it. Let's get on with this. So the first thing he said, Jesus said, was uh, watch out that you do not get led astray. For many will come in my name, he says, saying that I am he or I am. uh, And the time is at hand. Therefore, don't follow them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, don't be terrified. Okay. There are a lot of people today in Bible prophecy circles that they, you know, they are like, you know, in the Bible prophecy critics uh, say, well, this is just all fear driven. You know, it's just, it's just make, making people afraid. It's just, it's just uh, you know, getting people afraid of what's coming. Uh, you know, it's just all just a, a message of fear. But Jesus said, do not be terrified. Okay, let's read on again. This is uh, again, verse nine. When you hear of wars and disturbances, don't be terrified for these things must happen first, but the end won't come immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation. Boy, we've seen a lot of that. And kingdom against kingdom. 
There will be great earthquakes, famines, and plagues in various places. Yes, that's all happened for sure and continues to happen. There will be terrors, yes, terrors, and signs from heaven. This is talking about signs in the sky, like, you know, the, the stars, the moon, the, you know, the constellations, the sun. Verse 12. But before all these things... They will lay their hands on you and persecute you. Isn't this something? Jesus says, basically, you are going to get arrested and persecuted. He could have said, I'm praying for you and no, God's going to protect you from the persecution. God's going to protect you from the hard times, from the hardship. That's not what he said. He said, you are going to have hard times. You are going to have hardship. They are going to grab a hold of you. They are going to arrest you and they are going to persecute you. Let's go on. Delivering you up to synagogues. Uh, uh, synagogues, religious institutions. They're going to they're gonna get you in trouble with the religious authorities. Let's read on. And prisons. They're going to put you in prison. Think about how many Christians today would... Uh, they would believe that anybody in prison has got to be a bad person because, you know, there's a lot of people today, Christ, like, it doesn't matter what religious group you're, you're, you associate with, but there's a lot of people today that, you know, they, they, um, they confuse the law of the land with the law of God. You know, just because someone is arrested doesn't mean they've done anything wrong. Just because they're in prison doesn't mean they've done anything wrong. It just means they've done something wrong in the eyes of somebody. <laughs> okay? In the eyes of sun some judge or some, uh, you know, uh, group of people that have, uh, you know, voted laws in. Let's continue. So they will deliver you up to synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will turn out as a testimony for you. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to withstand or to contradict. You will be handed over even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. They will cause some of you to be put to death. You will be hated by all men for my name's sake, and not a hair of your head will perish. Like this, come, this goes right in line with what Jesus said earlier when he said to people, don't think I've come to bring peace. I don't come to bring peace, but a sword to divide, to divide you from your friends, to divide even families. I know some people say, well, it's Satan that causes division. Oh, it's Satan that is causing division in our friendship and in our group, in our church, in our family. You know, Satan is trying to divide our family. Satan is trying to divide our church. Don't say that. You might be just blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I mean, it could be God doing it. It could be Jesus himself doing it. Be careful not to overgeneralize things. And Jesus promises that you will be protected. Yes, you will be protected. Um, he will be with you through it all. He said, don't even worry about what to say beforehand. Don't even worry about it. He'll give you, he'll give you what to say. You know, he'll protect you. Verse 19, by your endurance, you will win your lives. By your endurance, you will win your lives. You need to stand firm. You need to endure. You need to be strong. When all so-called all hell breaks out against you, when your family goes against you, when your friends go against you, when your co-workers go against you, you need to stand strong. Don't be weak. Do not be led, you know, astray. Do not be easily influenced. Remember, you are the influencer, not the influencee, okay? So you need to be strong. You need to endure through the hardship. And when you do, then you will win your lives. Then you will be saved. This is conditional. This is conditional. Jesus said, endure to the end. Verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem, or in Hebrew, Yerushalayim, surrounded by armies, 
then you know that its desolation is at hand. It will come, my friend. It will come. Jerusalem is going to be a hot spot for the world, and the world's going to bring all of their armies against Jerusalem. And so I know some of the preterists think that you know they, they think this already happened. Not exactly the way you, that Jesus is talking about. No, yeah, Jerusalem has been encompassed and has been, you know, has seen war before and after the time of Christ. You know, several times. But Jesus is talking about a very special time, a very, very intense time of war, such as the world has never seen. And we haven't seen this yet. Verse 21. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the middle of her depart. Let those who are in the country not enter therein. For these are days of vengeance. God's vengeance, that is. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who nurse infants in, in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath to this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles have not yet been fulfilled, my friend. Gentiles are still in in power, so to speak, okay, in many places. Verse 25, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on earth anxiety of nations in perplexity for the, the roaring of the sea and the waves, hurricanes, tsunamis, floods, Verse 26, men fainting for fear and for expectation of the things which are coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The bodies of the heavens, the stars, and the galaxies will be shaken. It will be a very, very fearsome thing, such as have, you know, has not happened yet. Verse 27, then they will see Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is near. He told him a parable. See the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you you see it and you know by your own selves that the summer is already near. Even so, you also, when you see these things happening, know that God's kingdom is near. Now, notice that he talks about God's kingdom in two different ways throughout the scripture. First of all, he talks about God's kingdom in a spiritual way, as as in the, the, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is not a physical kingdom where you can say, look, it's there, look, it's here. It's not geographical. It is something that is within your hearts is when God comes and rules and reign in, reigns in your heart. Okay, when God rules your life, not you. God rules you. It doesn't matter what you feel. You know, to, when you completely die to self, crucify yourself, crucify your own pleasures and lusts, when you sacrifice yourself and just say, it doesn't matter what I think, what I feel, it's what, what God thinks, what He feels. It's not what I think is right, it's what God says is right. Okay? That is one part of God's kingdom. Another part, and what he's talking about here, God's kingdom being God's political kingdom coming on this earth. When he will set up his rule and reign over this earth, you know, ultimately, you know, when he finally comes back to earth to rule and reign. Verse 32, Most certainly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things are accomplished. Again, this is one of these verses that the preterist uses. They say, well, this generation, you know, Jesus is talking about a generation, such as, you know, like, you know, one generation is the father, is the next generation are the sons. Not necessarily. The word generation here can also mean the human race in, in, in general. You know, it could mean an age. It could mean the, the world, so to speak. It could mean, it could mean uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, a span of just decades to a span of millennia. 
Verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. There are some people who believe that Jesus' words have passed away because, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross. And, you know, now that we live on this side of the cross, you know, Jesus' words on that side of the cross is more like Old Testament. There are actual people that believe that. And that is that is not true whatsoever. That is a very, very deceptive thing. Jesus said that his words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away before the words of Jesus will pass away. Trust me, my friend, the word, everything that Jesus said and, and taught was from the Old Test, so-called Old Testament and will never pass away. Verse 34, so be careful or your hearts will be loaded down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day, the day of judgment, that is, the day of vengeance, that is, will come on you suddenly. For it will come like a snare on all those who dwell on the surface of all the earth. Therefore, be watchful all the time, praying that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will happen and to stand before the Son of Man. This is very, very serious. Think about it. The, Jesus is talking to his disciples here, and he's, say, he's talking to his believers, to his followers, okay? He is saying, listen, it is so serious. You need to pray that you are able, you are counted worthy to escape these things. It's going to be such vengeance. Pray that you're counted worthy to escape these things, and pray that you would be able to stand before the Son of Man. Do you know, my friend, how much power and how much glory it's going to, you know, there's going to be revealed when the Son of Man comes back to earth? I think the kings and the most powerful men on earth will be thrown to the ground by the power of, of God. And so you need to pray that you'll be able to stand. And you'll be able to, to withstand the, the vengeance of God, withstand the anger of God. And don't be so presumptuous, my friend, especially my evangelical friend. Don't be so presumptuous. Don't be so proud. Be humble. Cry out for his mercy. Cry out for God's mercy. Pray that you'll be able to stand in that day. Even though, you know, you got your presumptions, your assumptions, and you got what you believe is your faith that's going to save you. Well, listen, you better cry out for mercy. You better, you better cry out for mercy. Be humble. As the saying goes, be humble. You could be wrong. Cry out for mercy. Verse 37. Every day Jesus was teaching in the temple, and every night he would go out and spend the night on the mountain that is called Olivet. All the people came early in the morning to see him in the temple and to hear him. Listen, Jesus was in the temple. He didn't set up his own little church. He didn't set up a church building. He didn't set up another, you know, religion. He went to the temple. It says in another place, he, it's, it was his custom to attend synagogue. So, once again, let's read the scriptures. Let's Let's try to understand and see what it really says not what we think it says not what we project on it from our understanding of what church is not what we project on it from what we've heard before in the past preached by christian ministers which a lot i'm telling you i submit to you that a lot of them are corrupt so let's pursue truth and join me in my pursuit of truth and going back to first century Christianity where it was white hot, white hot with truth, white hot with sound doctrine, white hot with the power of God, okay? And as you seek truth, may you find it as you seek the Lord with all your heart, may you find him. And as you call upon him, may he show you great and mighty things, give you a spirit of revelation beyond all your peers. So may God bless you, and thanks again.